uh, I'm very, very much honored to have Russell L. Schweikert on the show tonight. And of course, this man is no introduction from for for most of our listeners, I guess. But 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 a little bit yes, because I think everyone knows Rusty Schweikart as 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 the Apollo 9's lunar module pilot, the first actual lunar module pilot who who flew uh, in, in in the Apollo 9 mission in 1969. But of course, there's a lot more. There's a lot more here, and and a lot more to discuss. Uh, for example, uh, once we, we, the the occasion where we first met was like 12 years ago on the uh, Congress of the International Astronautical Federation, the IAC in Glasgow, and 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 there we had a discussion, a very interesting discussion about your initiative about uh, asteroid mitigation. So there's a, a a lot of important issues that you've been working and on which you are working, I think, even nowadays. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation for this little discussion. And uh, uh, so first, I think there is a as as we have a lot of stuff stuff to discuss here. Uh, but 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 still, uh, I, I would still uh, suggest to to go back in time to 1968 because in 1968, uh, where NASA already had two. Saturn V rocket tests, which were unmanned, and Apollo 6 is something that I'm pretty sure that the present day NASA would classify as a near disaster. And if something like that would happen nowadays, it would certainly trigger at least two years or more of development, but it was 1968 and you were in the space race. So, so interestingly enough, they decided that, okay, there were some issues, but, but still we can manage to solve them and we understood what happened. So why not put people on the third Saturn V? And this was, this is what would have been the Apollo 8 mission and you were uh, slated for that mission together with Commander Jim McDivitt and David Scott. But, uh, of course, there were the Soviets who were speeding up their circumlunar program, and also there was the lunar module, which was which would have been on that flight, but it was not ready. And so NASA decided to swap these missions somehow, and so, so therefore uh, you found yourself on Apollo 9, as the first lunar module pilot, and and so here come my questions. The fir first question is, is uh, how did this actually happen? There are a lot of versions in space history. Some say <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. Some say that Jim McDavid, for example, had some say in that. So others say he did not. But it, I'm wondering what is your version. For example, did you have any say in in that changing of the missions, or, or how did it happen? Well, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> if I if I did at some point have an idea, I've certainly forgotten it. Um, uh, that was a long time ago. I, I would. Yeah. I, I'm quite certain that Jim McDivitt would have had something to say about it, mm -hmm. um, without any question. Um, Jim was the commander, and he was uh, in the second group of astronauts uh, that was selected. And I was, in fact, Dave Scott and I were both in the third group. So, you know, Jim was not just our commander, but he was a senior, fairly senior in the office at the time. This was the second time that he would have commanded a, a mission. He, he commanded the Gemini 4 mission as well, with uh, uh, along with Ed White. But uh, so I'm sure Jim McDivitt had, uh, had something to say about it. Yeah, because that's what Andrew Andy Chaikin, who I think wrote one yeah. of the best books on the Apollo program, A Man on the Moon. What what he writes here at at one point uh, is this: uh, uh, few astronauts would have been surprised to learn that Jim McDavid had turned down the circumlunar circumlunar mission to stick to this one. And, and here comes the funny part. They wouldn't have said it publicly, but many saw Apollo 8 as a little more than a ride. No flying involved, but Apollo 9 was a test pilot's feast. In truth, it was more difficult, more ambitious, and in some ways more dangerous than Apollo 8. So, so of course, you as a lunar module pilot, you had a, a very key role in that mission. But, but uh, if, if you were offered uh, the chance to choose whether going to the moon, around the moon on Apollo 8 without a lunar module, or 
going to the Earth orbital mission, you would have chosen Apollo 9? Yes, definitely. Yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what no I question. thought. Now, now, you know, historically, though, I mean, it, it, I mean, as far as a test pilot is concerned or you know, any, anyone who wants to fly something, Apollo 9 was certainly the, the mission over Apollo 8. But on the other hand, in terms of history, I think Apollo 8 is, is uh, and, and will be in the future far more memorable than Apollo 9. Apollo 9 was really a kind of engineering uh, test flight. Uh, but Apollo 8 was the first uh, time that human eyes, you know, had looked back from outside of the Earth's gravity, uh, you know, around another body in the solar system, looked back at Earth and, and saw our home as it really is, you know, uh, alone in, in the blackness of space. I mean, that was a truly historic mission. So, but, you know, I'm very happy to have been on Apollo 9 and been the uh, lunar module pilot. Yeah, the first the first actual lunar module pilot ever. This is this is fantastic, and 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 I think it it gives me goosebumps just to think about the fact that this was the first time ever than than a, a spacecraft that was carrying people in space that was not able to get back to Earth. Yeah, I mean that that must have been kind of a kind of a well a strange feeling i i'm pretty sure and 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 not just that but there were a lot of really a lot of unknowns so i think it's up to this day apollo 9 classifies as as, as one of the most ambitious space missions ever i think well i think i i think again from an engineering point yes. of view i think that's absolutely right i mean there were many many i mean there was a whole brand new spacecraft being tested uh, in in the company of another very new spacecraft that it only had like what two flights before it. So I mean, it it was really a, a tremendously ambitious uh, flight. But on the other hand, you know, we didn't have to land on the moon, and um, landing on the moon uh, was pretty hairy as well. I mean. Uh, you know, the, yes, the lunar module had been proven by that time, but not the landing capability. So, uh, in the whole program was pretty ambitious in comparison with a lot of things that have happened since. Yeah, that's right. And 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 okay, uh, in in this uh, is fantastic mission. You were, yeah, actually also another test flight is was was the test flight of of a practically a third spacecraft that is the that is the EVA suit which right. right which had its own portable life support system that was the very first time in the american space program or maybe in the whole space program including the soviets i'm not sure about that but but certainly you were the very first uh, american astronaut to, to have an own life portable life support system with you and and uh, of course that was also a, a crucial element and something that is also not emphasized and the russians didn't manage to do that for years is the docking tunnel which now seems to be trivial to all of us for my, my generation that the two spacecraft dock and you open the hatch and you go through but th this is something that was also brand new technology right so this is also something that apollo 9 tested first if i'm not mistaken yeah, it was. And thank heaven, um, uh, subsequent flights and subsequent tunnel designs or docking system designs have not followed the Apollo model. Uh, the Apollo model, the, if, if you will, the, um, the circumference of the tunnel was very simple. It was just two tubes that, that met up. But in the middle of it was a docking probe and a drogue. And they were very, uh, the, the drogue was simple. It was just a funnel with a hole in the end at the, at the small end. But the probe was an extremely complicated device. I don't know if you know what, uh, it's probably an American slang thing, but what we call a Rube Goldberg device. It's a, you know, it's a device, it's a ridiculously complex and complicated device, almost, <laughs> you know, almost to the point of being, uh, you know, absurd. But, um, uh, but now the tunnels, uh, the docking systems occur or the, the actual moving mechanisms are at the periphery, at the, at the edge of the tunnel on the circumference. And the center is always clear. You don't have to take a, a complicated thing out of the middle. So our, our docking system was very complex and 
one of the reasons why my EVA, my spacewalk was so important was because uh, when we separated the two spacecraft uh, on the day we tested the rendezvous techniques, um, when we came back together, if E either if the tunnel uh, or the probe didn't work or if we, you know, if we crashed them together and broke something and couldn't get the probe out of the tunnel, the only way we could get back, Jim McDivitt and I could get back into the command module and, by the way, to our heat shield, <laughs> which would allow us to return alive, um, was to go externally. Uh, we could go up the outside of the lunar module and across and into the command module hatch. And so that was the purpose, uh, one of the primary purposes of my EVA on the, you know, the third day of the mission. And uh, yeah, and and if if I I'm pretty sure that a lot of people have asked this, but if did you have something like a, a, a kind of a favorite moment or something like a moment of re of, of revelation or something like that, and, and like an Apollo eight Earthrise mo moment or something like that for you in in the mission. And if it's not a stupid question, maybe it is. <laughs> well, it's not. No, it's not a stupid question at all. But uh, and, and in fact, I hadn't really thought about that. But I don't, we didn't really have any surprise. I mean, in terms of something like the, as you say, the Earth rise, uh, you know, seen in, in Apollo 8, which was really very spectacular and dramatic and, and frank and frankly, historically significant. Uh, but we didn't we didn't really have any big surprises. Um, the only thing that went wrong with the mission was when we went to undock, um, if you will, the, the probe uh, didn't let go of the drogue in that tunnel that we were just talking about. Um, in the simulator, uh, all Dave Scott had to do was push the switch up and let it go. And the, the, the probe would extend and push the lunar module away, and it would just keep going. But in the real world, what we found out <laughs> during the mission was that the probe extended OK, but when it got to the end of its uh, full extension, the three little capture latches at the end hadn't let go of the drogue. And so it went bang, and all of a sudden, our separation velocity went to zero, you know, oh. and um, and it made quite a bang. And McDivitt and I looked at each other, you know, like what the devil was that? <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, we 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 kind of looked at one another and looked at, up through the window and saw that the you know we weren't separating anymore. So we figured, well, maybe we should tell Dave to bring us back into a hard dock and ask the ground uh, what they think we should do. And about that time, uh, Dave Scott said, oh, OK, you're free now because he w hit the switch again. <laughs> so <laughs> Jim and I looked at each other and was like, well, OK, Dave, I hope we didn't break anything and we can get back OK. <laughs> we'll find out in eight hours. <laughs> yeah, so, well. Yeah, so that was the only surprise that we had, and that was very mild. And it and there was and actually the probe and drogue worked fine when we got back together. There was no problem. So, but it was it was a, it was in in a way quite a smooth mission. I, I should say a few hmm. things for people who who don't um, who don't understand it. In training, when you're doing the simulations, flying the simulators, um, and training for something like a rendezvous and a docking. Um, the, the, you're almost never doing it without failures. And it's not that the simulator fails, it's that the, simul that the people who are running the simulation create failures so that you have a challenge. Therefore, when we got in flight, this might be the moment you were, you were asking for, actually, during the rendezvous, uh, you know, we're going through the same procedures that we use in the simulator, but McDivitt and I are looking at each other and we're not busy, you know, we're, we're kind of, it's, everything is pretty easy and we've got enough time to look out the windows and 
do all the backup calculations and all and it's and we're kind of looking at each other and it's like how, how come we got so much time and, and the reason was because everything was working <laughs> <laughs> and in and in the lunar case that's even more the situation why because a lunar orbit takes two hours whereas an earth orbit takes an hour and a half hmm. and so uh the you know two hours divided by one and a half, you know, uh, 120 over over 90 is the ratio of the amount of time that you've got for the same things to be happening because, you know, they happen in an angular, uh, with angular motion yes, of the yes. planet. So uh, it, it would take another, uh, you had all kinds of time. Uh, things seem to be much simpler in reality than they were in the simulations. Yeah. Well, it's amazing. It's something nice. that, that I never <laughs> thought, never thought, because I thought that there is always, a, I thought the opposite, frankly. I right. really thought that, that, I think, that it's, I think most people there's do. much yeah, more yeah. time pressure in the real mission because there is, you know, weightlessness and a lot of other factors. So, so it's interesting to hear, actually. Yeah. <laughs> it's just the other way around. <laughs> well, generally speaking, that's, that's not true during the EVA. In, in almost uh, every case, the actual fact in the EVA um, your time is really precious. Uh, things take almost always take a bit more time than you think they're going to. But that's partly because, um, you know, EVAs, uh, especially today, you're doing real work. We were sort of testing the spacesuit and, you know, uh, doing just basically checking things out. Whereas today you do an EVA because you've got a lot of work to do. And you're making connections and you know assembling things and taking things apart and unscrewing things and bolting things together you know things are always like the same thing happens around your house you know when you got to fix the plumbing <laughs> it never works the way it's supposed to <laughs> so evas generally are more challenging than the simulations of them but the rendezvous turned out to be uh you know, uh, fairly straightforward and all that work, everything worked right. So that was wonderful. Actually, and on, on your EVA, you, I have to tell you that, that you took one of my favorite picture uh, images or, or, uh, or, or snapshots of the entire Apollo program. So yeah. I don't know why, but but this one that is also on your website on the, on the header, but in in which David Scott uh, is doing his stand up EVA and the, in the CM, and you are taking this uh, this yeah that's great from the porch or or I don't know from from kind yeah. of that direction and and wow I I, the, the, I think I think this is this is one of the my my five one of my five favorite uh, space photos ever. And yeah, so I it's just it's to beautiful. figure out why it's so good. And I asked my artist friends whether the ratios, golden ratio, whatever. I, I, I still don't know. <laughs> it's an amazing picture. Yeah. <laughs> so you're, you're one of my favorite photographers. Wonderful. <laughs> All right. Uh, and okay, but but uh, there is a lot more uh, to discuss because uh, uh, after after leaving the astronaut office, uh, you you not soon after that, if I'm not mistaken, you and some other colleagues, also Soviet colleagues, you 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 uh, created this Association of Space Explorers (ASE), which is yeah. basically. A fraternity of people who have orbited the Earth, or something like that, and 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 this is an international association of astronauts, and and well, it's it's quite sad actually that that we are not making this discussion uh, in 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 real life because the ASE conference would have been in Budapest last year, actually. Right. But but uh, apparently because of the COVID, it, it didn't happen. And I, I, I'm afraid it will not happen this year either. I'm not sure about that. But 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 you were uh, a very important uh, member of this. Or, or you, basically, was it your idea, actually? Yeah. To, it was your, yeah, your I, idea. I, I started it because uh, I had always felt that... Um, uh, you know when, when you you know what the little astronaut pin is that we wear on our yes. collar. Well, when we first started talking about that, um, I can remember a conversation that John Glenn and I had, 
And I said, I was brand new in the office at that time, a brand new astronaut. And, and I said to John, uh, well, John, what do you think? I, mean, I went into his office and I closed the door so I wouldn't be heard by anybody else. Uh, I always felt John and I had a good understanding. So I said, John, is this pin going to be just for we American astronauts or will this be for people who have flown in space? What, what, what do you think? And, um, and John kind of looked up at me and, and looked up a little bit sideways. And he said, Rusty, he said, that's a very interesting idea. He said, but I don't advise <laughs> that you make that suggestion. <laughs> um, and it was like, oh, OK, John, I won't say that. <laughs> but I had in mind uh, from the very beginning that and it, it became much more a powerful thought to me, idea after I flew that seeing the Earth from looking at the Earth from space is an experience that is important for people Share. And, and this is a this is an experience of human life, not just Americans and Russians or Soviets at that time or Hungarians or whatever. This is this is all of humanity. This is Earth life, which is beginning to move out from this beautiful planet of ours um, into space, our mother, in, in, in a sense. And uh, so I felt that it was very important that we be able to meet as a group of people who shared this unique, very forward-looking experience um, uh, of flying together in space. So, so I started the idea, and um, it was literally at the height of the Cold War. And when I uh, when I first went to the Soviet Union. Um, my purpose, my actual purpose, was to explore whether the cosmonauts might be interested in forming uh, an organization of, of this kind. Um, but of course, I couldn't say that. So I, I you know, the, the the formal excuse for me going to the Soviet Union was to brief the uh, Institute of USA and Canada Studies and the Soviet Academy on U.S. energy policy. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> because I was chairman of the California Energy Commission at the time. Um, but in fact, the reason that I went over there in 1970, I think it was in 72 when I first went to uh, Moscow. And I met with, uh, you know, some of the cosmonauts that I had already met. We weren't what I would call good friends at that time because I, we'd only met on rare occasions and we had very little time with one another. But the purpose of forming the organization was so that we could get to know each other and really share this experience that we had all had with the people of the world um, together. And um, so at any rate, um, uh, yeah, it was my idea and I took it over there. Uh, I had a couple of other uh, of the US astronauts who were supportive of the idea, many in the middle and some very strenuously opposed to the idea. Hmm. Um, and it was very difficult to get to get it going because, again, it was at the height of the Cold War. And um, so I stuck my neck out and I later got punished for it. But <laughs> but oh. we, you know, we we survived it. And uh, now uh, the ASC is a well-established organization that, you know, 30 some years later. Yeah, it is. And and apparently it also it, it, it's doing a very important job and, and you're dealing with very important issues, one of which is asteroid yeah. threat mitigation, right. which yeah. is the topic that that you presented 12 years ago in mm -hmm. the IAC. And, right. and I'm still amazed because I, that, that there there is some aspect here that I never thought about, mm -hmm. namely that it really requires a, a global coordination uh, yeah. to, to mitigate an asteroid. And, and uh, what if, if I if I if I'm understanding it correctly, you were drafting uh, some sort of a protocol to how to to deal with such an issue internationally. And it turns out to be a very tricky question. So please tell us why. Why, why is that even an issue? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. OK. Well, I mean, there are there's in, in a way there are three aspects to uh, 
protecting the Earth from asteroid impacts. Um, early warning is the obvious one. You know, you have to find them out there, plot their orbits, and predict are they going to hit the Earth or not at some point in the future. Well, as soon as you figure out what the orbit of another body out there is, and you've got the Earth orbit, you can project them ahead for, you know, 100 years and know whether they're going to intersect and whether there might be an, uh, a collision or not. So that's early warning, and we do that with telescopes, uh, et cetera. Uh, I'll let that go for the moment. Uh, the second one is, uh, you know, if you do uh, see that the orbits of an asteroid and the Earth intersect, then the question is predicting whether or not they're both going to be at the intersection at the same time at some point in the future. And if the answer is yes, then you've got to deflect them. You've got to go up and deflect the asteroid. That is, you've got to change the asteroid's orbit very slightly so that the rendezvous does not occur. And that is the planetary defense. That, that's the active uh, asteroid deflection process. But the third issue is that this is, that any asteroid which has a probability of hitting the Earth uh, may hit along a line that goes across the Earth, entirely all the way across the Earth. It may be sort of toward the top of the Earth. It may be toward the bottom. It may be through the middle. It may be tilted, you know, clockwise or counterclockwise in the way you're looking at it. But uh, there is a line all the way across the Earth, which is what we refer to as the risk corridor. In other words, if the asteroid that, that you're talking about has a probability of hitting the Earth and it does hit the Earth, it will hit somewhere along that line. But you don't really know where because your tracking has to be much, much more accurate than is possible in order to have that line shrink to a point. So the, the, your tracking accuracy five years, 10 years ahead of an impact is not good enough to know where it's going to hit. So when you launch a mission, you're not sure who's going to get hit. Is it the United States? Is it going to end up in the middle of the Atlantic? Is it going to be Spain? Is it going to be, you know, Hungary? Is it going to be China? So the whole decision of going up to deflect to an asteroid that said, let's say an asteroid has a probability, you know, with all the tracking, the probability you can calculate is like one out of 10 that it's actually going to hit the Earth. That's the uncertainty in your tracking 10 years ahead. But you've got to launch now if you're going to deflect it, because if you wait till five years ahead, you can't get to it. You can't deflect it in, uh, in time. So the deflection process is going to be a huge geopolitical, uh, the, the, the decision to do it is a huge geopolitical decision. Do we or don't we spend, you know, a half a billion dollars to go up and protect the Earth from an asteroid which may not hit the Earth, okay? And we're not going to know that until we get there. So that's a that's a very tough problem. Who pays for it? Who handles the liability if you decide, well, you know, the chances are 9 out of 10, it's not going to hit, and then lo and behold, it does hit. But we made a, somebody made a decision, a political decision, not to, not to deflect it. Wow, that, that that's a yeah. pretty big decision. So these are these are political decisions, and the worst one, of the, the worst political decision. It's a little bit hard to describe, but let me try very roughly to say: picture it's going to hit in the middle of that line, you know, in the middle of the Earth. Okay, but when you get up there, uh, you have to deflect that asteroid, and what you do when you deflect, in effect, when you change the orbit of the asteroid, you're taking the impact point, which was going to happen in the middle of the line, and you're pushing it along the line until it's off the Earth. Okay, but there are two different directions you can push it. And let's say to the east along that line is, you know, Vienna <laughs> or Budapest, okay? And to the left, to the west off the line, you know, is Washington, D.C. or Houston, okay? So which way do you push it? Well, the people who live in Houston say, oh, push it toward Europe. You know? 
And so, in either way you push it, you always uh, increase risk at, at other regions which normally would have been safe. Right, exactly. Uh, that, and, and so yeah. you are making a life and death decision potentially if something goes wrong. If the deflection goes well, you know, the impact point moves all the way off the earth either way. But if something goes wrong while you're deflecting it, then you have endangered people's lives somewhere that were not initially at risk, trying to save, trying to zero the risk for everybody. So there is a temporary increase of risk for people uh, elsewhere in order to eliminate the risk for everybody. And that is a humongous political decision to make. And it is not going to be easy for the world to make such a decision. Wow. And so that's why, that's why, you know, early warning and deflection are simple. They're technological, but the geopolitical decision making is really tough. And in this recent exercise that just went on that you've probably read about, you know, we've had planetary defense conferences where we do we do a hypothetical impact and then we play different roles and we try to, you know, uh, realistically play these decision making roles and see if we can deflect an, an asteroid impact. And the one that was just posited this year and, and put before the world community who are dealing with this. Uh, you know, the only way it could possibly be deflected because it was discovered too late, really, only a few years. I think it was like six months before it was going to impact. And the only possibility uh, is, was with a nuclear uh, explosion to literally fragment it and blow it up. And it couldn't be done in time. And it hit. I mean, you know, so there is a simulation that says, hey, we've got to we've got to get our telescopes working on this thing. We've got to discover them you know, decades ahead of their potential impact. And we can't wait until six months before to to find them coming. So, you know, these things are very, very challenging. And one day, one day, probably not in my lifetime, slightly more probable in your lifetime, <laughs> but certainly one day we will be confronted with this decision as a planet. There's not a question. It's only a matter of when. Yeah, I think th this is exactly why I think it's a perfect. It, it, it's it's you're the perfect person to address this issue because I always say that that had, if the dinosaurs would have had a space program, they they wouldn't have become extinct. <laughs> well, and, let, let, let's let's say if they had a reasonable international political system, yeah. <laughs> They might have avoided extinction. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. I don't, well, know, I don't know. We don't, I don't think many of us have a great deal of confidence in the wisdom of our political system yet. Oh, it's a, that's it, right. It's an area of life that I think uh, warrants dramatic improvement. <laughs> that's right. Okay, but okay. One one last question, I think. Oh, actually, actually, I have two, but but I already it took too much time, I guess. But but <laughs> one, one thing, one thing that I wanted to ask for sure is, is is your opinion about the the human space program that is being defined now in 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 the U.S. I'm 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 thinking about Artemis and and the Gateway and these kind of things because I asked you similar questions. 12 years ago when the George w, George W Bush's vision for space exploration was was on the move and then you said you uh, you are not a strong advocate of the program that's what you said very diplomatically <laughs> because we should focus on earth more which and I liked it very much that you said that but but what do you, how do you feel about what is happening now well, uh, first of all, let me let, let me uh, I, I don't want to say correct, but let me uh, amend at least uh, uh, the comment that you attribute to me. Uh, uh, focusing on the Earth is an important thing to do uh, from space in part. Yeah, yeah. OK, sure, sure. That's what but I mean. In it, but in addition to that, um, it, it, it seems to me that that we are being born into the cosmos off the planet. And uh, and that is not just an observation, I see that as a responsibility. We are uh, we are very powerful in terms of affecting our future evolution. 
and whether we successfully um, move into space from uh, Mother Earth uh, and mature and grow up uh, and expand life out of Earth into space is going to be largely up to us. And I believe that's a very, very serious responsibility. For that reason, I'm, I'm very supportive of the long range vision that exists, but almost as much today in the minds of particular individuals like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and others and many, many young people uh, as with NASA um, or any of the national space programs. I think the entrance into space exploration of private space initiatives has been a huge and extremely powerful evolution in itself. Governments are very unwieldy. They use taxpayers' money, um, the money of their citizens, uh, people like um, you know, Jeff Bezos and, and Elon Musk and others can spend their own money and take risks which government officials are very reluctant to take. They might make a mistake. My God, how horrible. <laughs> uh, Elon Musk lives on making mistakes. I mean, <laughs> the fastest way to learn, as all of us who ski know very well, <laughs> is to fall down. You don't learn how to ski without falling down. Uh, now, if you fall down continuously and you never are able to get down a hill, that's a different matter. But the most rapid learning comes in learning from failure, learning from making mistakes and trying things and that not quite working. So I'm very enthusiastic about the long range space program, uh, but I am more enthusiastic uh, about the fact that um, uh, that at least the U.S. space program, and I think others will be following suit, it may already be happening in China to some extent, that national programs are going to be working closely with uh, private initiative where there is a bit less aversion to risk taking and to failures. So I'm, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic and I certainly agree with Elon Musk that you know, the human future has to be um, multi-planetary. Uh, I don't, I don't mm -hmm. think there's a question. In, in my mind, it will be, you know, in the long run out into the galaxy. And I think we will meet some friends out there at some point in the distant future, not anytime soon. <laughs> anyway, that, that, that anyway. Is a, I think that this is a perfect, perfect final word. So, so, so let it be. Let it be. Okay. Well, it, it will be if we work to make it so. So let us make it. Let us make it so. Let us enable it and facilitate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's correct. That's a, that is a great responsibility for each of us as human beings. Okay, Rusty Schweikart, thank you so much for your time and patience and for the amazing discussion and the amazing information that you have provided to our listeners. And, oh, Miklos, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I, I've enjoyed it very much. 